in the second part of chapter 13, we're going to take a look at some of the terminology that goes along with different aspects of infection and, and disease. So some of this stuff you may already be familiar with, and a lot of this is just a, a terminology and memorization. So this ought to go somewhat quick. There's only two review sections in, in the last part here. Okay, but we'll go through it here. Now this part, if you're in the lab, we've covered this already. We went through these terms where we talked about incubation, prodromal, period of invasion, and convalescent periods. And then in the lab, I compared these to the stages of growth that microbes go under in a test tube. <clears throat> Remember, we had the lag phase, the exponential growth, stationary, and death. So recall these are very similar. Skip forward here just real quick. And we can see these in a, in a, uh, a table or a, a graph, rather, excuse me. And we see that, generally speaking, they start out with no noticeable growth. And this essentially represents a time from which they enter to the time in which they actually start multiplying and are on their way to causing problems. So incubation prodromal is a term that describes the beginning stage of infection, typically when the host just begins to feel symptoms. Invasion represents the height of infection or, or steps leading up towards that, kind of classified as one big chunk here, but, but technically there's a graduation there. And then the convalescent period is the general time period from which the host is recovering and the symptoms reside. Okay, so again, if you're in lab, you've seen these, and these are relatively straightforward. You just have to recognize what each of them means. <clears throat> Some other terms here relate to the way the microbes can potentially spread throughout the body. So we talked about virulent factors. We talked about the fact that microbes can uh, release enzymes that will break down body tissue. And this can, in some cases, allow them to move throughout the body. Now, in some cases, they won't do any of that. They stay localized. And a localized infection is what it sounds like, one where they stay in one area. A focal infection is one where they will break loose from one area and spread to another immediate area, typically in a, uh, a very close uh, tissue. Focal infections are probably not real common. But in this case, a, a, an infection starts in one area and spreads to somewhere typically nearby, as I mentioned, although theoretically it could spread to some other location in the body. What is real common, however, or relatively common, is called a systemic infection. A systemic infection is one in which microbes enter the body, or enter the bloodstream, rather, and actually travel throughout the body. You can think of the bloodstream, or even the lymphatic system, two things that we'll talk about in more detail in the next chapter, you think about these as kind of like the highway system for the human body, and especially the bloodstream. It carries blood throughout our whole body, stuff you already know. But when microbes get into this and survive, this essentially gives them transportation throughout the body. And if they can attach in other locations and continue to grow, then the infection can become spread throughout the entire body. Often a life-threatening situation, one that uh, at the very least requires immediate medical attention, to say the least. But um, those are just uh, some of the general patterns of infection. So, a primary infection is somewhat self-explanatory. As the name implies, it's an infection that starts from the initial onset. And typically, this is all that an individual will have. So it's not to say that there's anything besides a primary infection typically um, occurring. In some cases, though, a secondary infection can pop up in which you have additional microbes either complicating or intensifying. And one of the things that can happen here is that the immune system can become preoccupied with the primary infection. Sometimes the duration of the infection goes on too long. The body's immune resources become overly compromised or overly expended, so to speak. And as a result, the host can almost become temporarily immune compromised to a certain extent. And as a result, a secondary type infection can occur. This is one of the factors that goes, that I should say, used to go into doctors prescribing antibiotics for patients even when they had a viral infection, or even when it might have been assumed they had a viral infection. It is known that in some cases a secondary bacterial infection can result from a primary viral infection. While not common, that is a consideration when a, when a doctor is seeing a patient. So it used to be more common for the doctor to just go ahead and give the antibiotics just to make sure and to clear up anything that might come up. And now, as you probably know and as we've talked about a little bit, doctors are getting away from that with all the new information and all the new procedures that uh, are, are warning against overuse of antibiotics. That's something that you don't see nearly as much as you used to. Uh, but it's still a real a reality, by the way, that can still happen, and that is something that doctors have to weigh. I think the, the conversation is starting to shift more towards the patient's responsibility 
to monitor their health. And if they notice that the, the infection goes on too long, uh, at that point they may need to go back and, and then get the antibiotics only when necessary. And that would avoid many of them being unnecessary. So that's the idea of a secondary infection. So somewhat self-explanatory, but maybe not quite as much as a primary. These terms down here, acute versus chronic, again, you may be familiar with these. Acute is just a short term and typically goes away relatively fast, so rapid onset, short-lived. Chronic infections are more long-term. They can progress slowly and, and last for uh, potentially the entire lifetime of a host. There are many diseases that can, are just um, in a chronic state permanently. Sometimes they come and go. There are many diseases that flare up and go away. Uh, an example of this we talked about in chapter 5 would be Chagas disease. Chagas disease can, in, in some cases, enter into a chronic infection state in which the host has flare-ups uh, on and off, on and off. Um, uh, chronic infections are, are often very difficult to diagnose. These can sometimes go undiagnosed for long periods of time. A, a patient may think that there's, may, they may, I should say they may have no indication that there's actually an infection. They may think that they're just uh, weak or, or maybe something's just off or they're not sleeping or their, their diet's just not good. And there's a lot of conditions like chronic, fi chronic fatigue syndrome that may actually, in some cases, be determined to, to be uh, caused by an infection. Uh, Lyme disease is one that tends to, to cause a, a chronic type condition or can, I should say, if not treated early, can cause a chronic infection. Uh, some of the classic examples are things like hepatitis C, HIV, the Epstein-Barr virus is another one. Uh, so there's a number of infections that, that can enter into this number of tick-borne diseases like uh, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. So while these are not the norm, there are certainly a number of examples where these do happen, and they're certainly not quite as easy uh, to diagnose and certainly have a different pattern than the acute. And, and to sort of clarify, and just to go back here, when we talked about the graph here and the, the stages of infection, really this is more in line with the acute form of infection, uh, the, the, the acute type of infection, I should say. So typically an acute infection follows this pattern pretty closely. A chronic infection may not follow this at all, to be quite honest. It may have really, really long incubation periods, very, very, very little prodromal. Uh, periods of invasions may come and go, may flare up and go away. So this this really is more representing an acute form, which is by far the most common, but uh, not necessarily what's going to happen every time. These next terms here descri describe signs of infection in the blood. So a sign, by the way, is something that you can objectively measure, where a symptom is something that's more subjective. So a sign would be, say, for example, someone has a fever, and with the thermometer, you measure that to be whatever it may be, 101 degrees, and, and you can objectively say this patient has a fever. Uh, a symptom is something more like a description of what's happening in the body, typically from the patient themselves. So they may say, for example, that uh, I have a, a headache, or they, that their stomach hurts, or that they don't feel good. Those are typically things of, more of a, of a symptom as opposed to a sign. So generally speaking, a sign you can objectively measure. So this next slide here is taking a look at some of the terminology that go along with signs of infection in the blood. So this first one here, leukocytosis, is an indication that you have a higher than normal white blood cell count. Now this is often determined by what's called a complete blood count. This is a, a test in which the blood is measured typically through a computer and the computer is giving it a, an estimate of the number of, of white blood cells in a given amount of a patient's blood. And these numbers then are cross-referenced with what are kind of some of the known and expected averages from someone of the same demographic. And then typically that tells the physician or whoever is analyzing that test uh, if that person has a, a normal, higher, or even sometimes a lower than average count of white blood cells. Now, in the case of an infection, if someone is known to have an infection or suspected to have an infection, then it's actually predicted that leukocytosis would be present. So this is actually a normal response, and this is actually a review question, by the way. So leukocytosis is a normal response to infection. And while it's not good that you have an infection, it is actually good to see that your body is responding with a higher, than, uh, a higher white blood cell count than what you'd normally have. So that's an indication that the immune system is doing what it's supposed to do. Leukopenia, on the other hand, is a decrease, and this is never good. Your body should really never have a lower than average normal white blood cell count there are really no good reasons why this is happening. Now, some people, from what I understand, can genetically have a lower count, which I think technically is still considered leukopenia. There's probably different contexts you could apply this in. 
I know I've talked to people firsthand who've, who've said that they're be described as being somewhat uh, of, 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 I guess you call it leukopenic. I'm not sure if that's actually even correct, but described as having leukopenia. Um, so that's that's something that can vary. But generally speaking, if you have a condition that causes the body to lower from what would be normal to then abnormally low, that that's always bad. Some pathogens can do this. There are bloodborne pathogens that deplete the body of white blood cells. Certain cancers. Uh, like leukemia can cause this, but generally speaking, a lower than normal white blood cell count is never really a good thing. Whereas leukocytosis, an increase, is actually at least a normal response to a bad situation. And then septicemia is another way to describe what's happening during a systemic infection, which we talked about here. So these are very similar terms. They sound very similar. Uh, a systemic infection is where you have them spreading throughout the body, and it's in the condition of septicemia is which they're present and multiplying in the blood. Very seemingly almost identical definitions there, but slightly different, but they more, more or less describe the same thing. These two here would be analyzed, leukocytosis and leukopenia would be analyzed with a complete blood count or a CBC, whereas septicemia is generally analyzed through a blood culture. And, and looking to see what types of pathogens may grow on a culture and things like selective differential media can be used to distinguish uh, pathogens from non-pathogens. Here's a real quick review on that last section there and then we'll go ahead and finish this last part. This will be real quick as I mentioned. One thing that happens with a number of people is they have infections that go unnoticed, and these are referred to as asymptomatic infections. Now, asymptomatic infections are probably the most difficult because there are no symptoms. So that means asymptomatic, to clarify, means that you don't have symptoms. Or there are, I should say, there are subtleties of this. So generally speaking, that's how it's described. But asymptomatic infections may be a condition in which the symptoms aren't obvious or they're not attributed to an, a pathogen. So for whatever reason, the host isn't aware generally that they're actually infected. So typically that means that there really are no symptoms. Now, this is an issue because then if, some, if the host isn't aware that they're infected, then they typically never take any steps to correct it. Obviously, there's no real immediate threat or need, so the host is oblivious in most cases. And, you know, the, sad, the scary part is any, any of us could be in this condition right now and not even know it. Um, what happens, though, is that this allows the pathogen to continue to spread, often through the asymptomatic host, to then other individuals who may develop symptoms. Now, it may be that it passes from one person to another and, and no one ever develops symptoms, but there are a number of cases in which one person may not have symptoms and then another one does. So in a, in an example here, one of the most common sexually transmitted diseases is the human papilloma virus or the HPV virus. In this scenario, males rarely, if ever, show no symptoms but transmit it to women who then can develop symptoms which can lead to things like cervical cancer which is obviously a very serious condition so while males may be asymptomatic their transmission to women can then become a real problem so these are conditions that really give the host or give the the pathogen rather an opportunity to spread and and generally increases their prevalence uh, throughout populations one of the things that's important to recognize is that generally the more subtle a pathogen is, the better off that pathogen will be. So pathogens that are really, really deadly and highly virulent, these are actually fairly bad pathogens. These are, are pathogens that typically tend to burn out over uh, relatively quickly in time. They may flare up and come back over time. Take, for example, the Ebola virus. Ebola, in some cases, has had an, uh, a death rate as high as 60, I, th I think in some cases as high as 90%. Uh, really really deadly that's a really high number but the problem is it burns through all its victims so quickly that there's in some cases almost no one left to infect or people take really dramatic steps to prevent any any further infection so in this case the pathogen doesn't persist very long and it kind of burns itself out really quickly whereas a virus like hpv can spread through thousands of people before anyone even realizes it at that point it's very difficult to eliminate so generally a pathogen is better off being more subtle and having a less obvious effect on the host. And actually what you see over time is pathogens tend to gravitate towards that end, being less harmful and more subtle. And, and, and the most subtle way that you can really get is to be completely asymptomatic, not showing any symptoms.
So asymptomatic carriers then are people, really as I just described, who carry but don't show infection or don't show signs, therefore continue to spread. Uh, an incubating carrier is someone who has been infected but is not yet aware of it. So in this case, and this, these sometimes may be described in the same way. It's, it's You don't always know exactly where someone's at in the, in the progress, but generally the incubating carrier is someone who will show symptoms but has yet to do so because the pathogen is in the incubating stage. Um, there are some cases like take the HIV virus in which the incubating stage can last for several years. Uh, there are many people who don't show symptoms for, for years after the initial infection of the, of the, of the virus, or they may show early symptoms, but they're not attributed to the virus. There's actually a condition in which the virus flares up uh, very briefly, and then the patient recovers, and oftentimes doesn't really attribute that to anything other than maybe a temporary illness. And so they may not even think twice about it and go on to spread that uh, before, maybe even years later, they find out they actually have the virus, and, um, and at that point maybe have spread it to a number of people unbe uh, unbeknownst. And then the convalescent carrier is one who is recovering, thinks that they're better, but is actually still contagious. And a common example here is from the uh, a virus called the norovirus. That's N-O-R-O-V-I-R-U-S, so the norovirus. And this one is actually fairly common. It's one of the most common types of stomach illnesses. When they typically say you have the stomach bug or the stomach flu, typically it's actually the norovirus that you have. There are other types out there, but that's the most common. And uh, in this case, there are... There are uh, Examples where a host can be contagious for days up to two weeks after they have uh, recovered. And this is a, a real problem because typically when people are sick, they tend to avoid contact and they're more conscious of, of the, their ability to spread the pathogen or spread disease. So they tend to take steps to reduce that. When they get feeling better, all that goes away and they're not worried about it anymore. And yet, in some cases, you're actually still as contagious up to several days to maybe even two weeks, probably in the extreme as you might have been when you were at your sickest, or in some cases, maybe even more so. So that's that's the, what happens with a convalescent carrier. Oops, excuse me. Chronic and passive carriers. Um, chronic carrier is one who, who holds it for long term. This goes right in hand with a chronic infection. So a chronic infection, in some cases, can lead to passage of one the, the virus to another one else, to someone else, the HIV, hepatitis C, uh, hepatitis B, even these are examples in which someone can carry it and then pass it on. Uh, a passive carrier is one who typically just picks it up and then passes it short term. Uh, these are by far the most common. Uh, in some cases, uh, an individual may not even necessarily know or ever even get sick for that matter. They so say they may not know that they're sick, but they may not even get sick. In this case, you may actually just pick it up on your hands and transmit them to someone uh, in the next room. So take, for example, a healthcare professional such as a CNA or nurse. Uh, you can be considered a passive carrier every time you touch someone, pick up a disease or potentially uh, get a pathogen on your hands and then walk into the next room, say you forget to wash your hands, transmit that to the next person, and that would be uh, an example of someone who's a, a passive carrier. <clears throat> this next slide here talks about reservoirs. And what we find with most pathogens, virtually all, is they, they have a, a location or a, a, uh, a point of origin uh, somewhere in the environment. And this is, can be either living or non-living. So a reservoir is simply where the pathogen exists and ultimately where it comes from. There are many animals that represent viral reservoirs, bacterial reservoirs. Soil is a good place to pick up bacterial pathogens. Um, tetanus actually t typically comes from the soil. Uh, there are a certain number of, of spore-forming bacteria, such as tetanus, that come from the soil. Uh, so, it, But a lot of times it actually tends to be another human being. So reservoirs can be just a person or a group of people. In the human population, there are many viruses that are simply passed back and forth over time uh, and eventually uh, either go away or, or go dormant and, and aren't seen. Um, many different strains of the virus come and go and mutate over time and become something different over time. So a reservoir is, is really just the, the kind of the origin or the, the kind of the, the, the place where the virus comes from. When we talk about animal viruses, we use the term vector to describe something that would that would transmit an infectious agent. So a reservoir 
can be a vector at the same time. So typically we use the term vector to describe that reservoir or that organism that's spreading the pathogen. Um, this term is something we'll also talk about when we get to chapter 10 and we start talking about DNA technology and how DNA uh, can be moved from one place to another, such as from a bacterial plasmid into a, a larger DNA molecule, what's called a cloning host. So I don't want to get into that now, but just recognize there are actually several different contexts by which the term vector can be used. And in fact, even in, in math, you can use the term vector uh, to describe, uh, I believe it's a line on a graph or something like that. So uh, different contexts here. But in this case, in, in this particular aspect, it's describing an animal or a living thing that, that transmits, excuse me, transmits uh, an infectious agent. The most common are insects, which are technically animals. Flies, mosquitoes, mosquitoes being the most common, ticks, things like that, fleas even are, are relatively common vectors. Uh, they tend to be blood sucking and most often it's when they are uh, acquiring blood from the host that they pass, usually inadvertently, but they, they pass parasites into the host's blood. Uh, other less common ones as listed down here, mammals, birds, reptiles, and things like that. These two terms describe the nature of the vector. So some vectors play more of a of a role in the life cycle. And so in this case, the biological vector would really be the same thing as the reservoir in most cases. So the biological vector is usually part of the life cycle. And so also part of the, the location in which the par parasite res resides, the reservoir. So typically the parasite has to go through the vector, the biological vector, in order to complete its life cycle. We used an example in chapter 5 when we talked about uh, the flea and how the, the cat flea, Diphlodium caninum, and how it goes through the, uh, the excuse me, I said that wrong, I said that wrong, excuse me. We talked about the, the tapeworm, excuse me, Diphlodium caninum, and how it goes through the flea or the cat flea to complete its life cycle. So in that case, the flea would be considered a biological vector for the tapeworm, Diphlodium caninum. Now, there are many more examples of what's called a mechanical vector, in which you simply have a parasite that is being picked up on the body, typically, of a vector and spread by contact. They don't play a role in the life cycle. Rather, it's simply being picked up and transmitted to a new location. The examples here typically revolve around things like houseflies and cockroaches. A fly may land on infectious material like animal feces and then pick bacteria or even viruses up on their feet and then fly into your sandwich, God forbid, and transmit that to your food. And that's a perfect example of a mechanical vector. So this is something that happens frequently and, and biological vectors are a little more complicated and, and typically play more of an intimate role in the cycle of the pathogen. Zoonotic pathogen is a term that describes a pathogen spread from animals uh, to people. And typically, this is a type of pathogen that comes from animals which we have close contact with. Typically, dogs and cats and, and pets, but also animals in zoos and, and horses and, and animals that are used for uh, different um, uh, jobs or, or used for specific purposes like working dogs and, and uh, cows and, and, and pigs, animals raised for, for consumption. So there are a number of pathogens that have a, a host range that allows them to jump back and forth. Even viruses in some cases can do this. So that's the idea of a zoonotic pathogen. They tend to be spread easily back and forth. There are a number of examples. One of the ones you may be familiar with the term is actually called cat scratch fever. Uh, also a Ted Nugent song. But this is actually a, a real thing. It's a parasite called Bartonella hensley. And this is a, a, an example of, of the zoonotic pathogen that's spread from cats to people. And when a cat bites you, there's a chance that they carry that, par that parasite, a bacteria, and will uh, puncture the skin and, and in essentially inoculate that bacteria beneath your skin. And once that happens, that can cause a nasty little infection. So a number of other disease examples there, but that's the idea.
One of the things that comes from the World Health Organization is an estimation that these uh, zoonotic pathogens may actually be a big part of an increasing disease presence that we talked about back in Chapter 1 called emerging diseases. So these are diseases that have either previously been unknown or have been seen in a new location or popped up uh, after a, a period of dormancy. And, uh, and they estimate that this is due to a process or a, a phenomenon referred to as deforestation and urban sprawl. In this scenario, what happens is parts of, of forested areas, often in the rainforest, are cut down. Uh, urban areas come up, and in this process, some of the natural reservoirs, who may have been undisturbed for, for years and probably never been disturbed prior, suddenly these reservoirs become in con they come in close contact with people for the first time. And as a result, potential diseases that have never been seen before can suddenly be transmitted with this... Uh, uh, contact that wasn't uh, previously uh, being made. So that's uh, an estimation of, of uh, maybe perhaps why we're seeing more certain, excuse me, why we're seeing more diseases and, uh, and uh, this would be, which would make sense because if, uh, if, a, if a reservoir never comes in contact with people, obviously there's no chance for any sort of transmission. Suddenly we tear down their living environment, we displace them from that environment, and now they uh, have no choice but to start to interact with people, and suddenly uh, parasites get transmitted that never would, never would have otherwise. So that's the idea there. And that's it. That's a real quick overview of the last part of Chapter 13. So go ahead and write down these review questions, and as always, let me know if you have any questions, and look for the next video here shortly. Talk to you later.